right. Um, I'm Sam. I'm an assistant research professor here, and I'm going to be talking mainly about using Raman spectroscopy to identify minor contaminants of rare earths, but there's a few other applications I will talk about. So the main, main thing that I've been looking at is using sort of using our Raman spectrometer as a photoluminescence um, tool to, to look at the luminescence signatures of various rare earth elements, which are significantly more intense than the Raman spectra. Um, this allows us to compare with a, a compilation of data that we've collected on just binary rare earth oxides and use these very intense signatures to identify the presence of rare earths even in very small amounts. Um, also talk a bit about using using Raman to look at oxygen defects, um, defects associated with um, with doping, um, contamination introduced during processing, and then I'll show some examples of using our our high temperature stage. And I think there's a lot um, a, a lot of different areas that we can apply these techniques to within within these projects. Um, so this is our, our instrument. It's a, it's a mapping Raman microscope. We have a pretty large stage on it. I don't have the actual dimensions, but it's maybe 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters that we can cover. Um, we have three different excitation lasers, um, which are listed, sorry, cut off here. So we have 455, 532, and a 785 nanometer laser. And then for the, the 532, mainly I'm using this extended range grading, which allows us to see a pretty wide range of wave numbers. And this is very useful for this luminescence technique because we can excite with a fairly high power laser, a very, fairly low wavelength, and then we can see the luminescence signatures over a pretty broad range. Um, so this, this gives us a pretty, eight, I think there are maybe eight or 10 rare earth elements that we could see within this range. And then depending on the objective we can use, um, we can get down to a pretty small spot size. So that's that's useful when we're doing mapping, trying to do some microstructural characterization using those. So this is from some previous work that we published. Um, this is a compilation of a bunch of the rare earth oxides that we've had in our labs. Some of them have a dashed line or where we have multiple um, sources from different vendors. And so there's three different sections here. First, all of the Raman ships are cut off, so everything below about 700 wave numbers. And then this is shown in, in wavelength. Um, depending on the wavelength, the laser wavelength that we're using, uh, some, some elements, such as Samaria here, we don't see anything with the red laser, but we see some pretty strong luminescence using the green laser, and unfortunately, the blue is a bit cut off here. Um, in, in the middle, we have four different neodymium oxides. They are all three nines or higher, according to the bottle, um, but they vary quite significantly, significantly in, the, in the luminescence spectra here. And also, there's some minor phases below, which we identify using XRD. Um, and then on the, on the right there are some, some elements which we don't to see luminescence in, but we still do anyway. Um, and these are from, from contaminants that are not the, the primary rare earth in these. But I will try to continue where I left off. Um, so, so on this page, I kind of summarized what the rare earth luminescence signatures are. I should go back and give a, a brief explanation of, of how these of how we actually get these luminescent signatures. So these are these are different from Raman shift. Um, I explained that we just cut the Raman shift signals off. Um, it's highly dependent on the on the crystal field surrounding the rare earth ion. How how we see these luminescent signatures, and it has to do with the, the stark field splitting as we excite to higher energy states, and then as we drop back down and we go through the splitting, we get all these distinct generally quite sharp luminescence peaks, um, like we see in the neodymium, but sometimes, um, like in this holmium, it's, it's sort of one fairly broad um, luminescence peak. So 
my intention is to use use all of this data um, that I showed in the previous slide with mapping on on our in this case Itria pellets to identify where we have minor species of rare earth elements and ideally identify what they are. Um, so on this slide, I'm using the green laser, um, and I've identified a few points, which I'll, I'll start with the right. So I've, in the, the map, this is a map across the cross section of the pellet. So it's about two millimeters across um, from left to right. And the color scale corresponds to the area which, as you can see, uh, green sector here, at about 2,500 wave numbers, you see the luminescent signature that corresponds with the europium 3 plus. Um, you can also sort of see in the, I don't know where the cursor is, but there's in the I have two spectra from the yttria pellet here, and you can see a few areas where there's some, some minor bumps. Um, up here is just from Nitria, but then there's some some minor signatures from rare earths, which I've seen throughout the entire sample. If I just take an average spectrum, so I think there's some I'd say some homogeneous contaminants, and then some inhomogeneous, as we can see from the bright red spot that corresponds to an area with with a higher concentration of europium. So there's there's obviously a lot of of stuff going on in these spectra, it's it's very hard to deconvolute it. And as I said, it, the luminescent signatures depend on the crystal field. So if we're looking at europium in Y203, or europium in CE203, or europium in CE02, the luminescent signatures will likely be different. Um, similar, but, but different. So it's, it's not quite as straightforward as just comparing with what we see here, um, but it's a, a good guideline. So on the on the left here, I've, I've pointed out a, a red spot and a blue spot where I see high and low area of a peak at 256 wave numbers. And there is another paper that I saw that reported that peak in europium doped Y203, but not in undoped. So I was kind of taking that as another indication looking at the Raman peaks instead of the luminescence. And you can also see that where we have a higher area of that Raman peak, there's a lot higher intensity of these luminescence peaks, although those don't necessarily correspond with their, where the europium is. So I can't fully explain where, where those come from at this point. Another one that I thought was interesting is I saw this one spot that corresponds with the luminescence that we see in, in chromium or in ruby. Um, I, in all the mapping that I did on these samples, I literally only saw it in one point. I suspect this kind of comes from, from processing somehow. I haven't seen it in any of the other rare earth precursors that we've used. Um, and this could be a very small amount. So on the right, I have a spectrum that I measured from some ruby that was grown in our lab. I measured this using the lowest power and the shortest exposure time, the smallest aperture possible, and then defocused the laser quite significantly in order to not cut off the spectrum by how intense the signal was. So in this case, the chromium 3 plus luminescence is very intense. And I, I suspect that, I, I don't want to try and guess an actual number, but we're able to, to measure very small concentrations of, of chromium that, that show up. What sample is this you're mapping here? This is the same, this is the Y203 as centered. Um, and then here's a map using a different laser. This is with our, our 455 nanometer blue laser. Um, and I see sort of in the center of the palette, there's sort of a, a long oval shaped spot, which if I remember right, I also saw some neodymium signatures in that, but right in the center, I see this peak that it shifted a bit and, and broadened, but it, it resembles quite closely the signature that we see from Holmium. And I, I believe we had some other reason to expect some minor amounts of Holmium in these samples. Um, there's some other stuff going on in this map that you can see on the sort of in the top right, you can see the outline of grains. Um, depending on how, how the polish of the sample is, you can get 
differences, especially like minor shifts in the Raman peaks where grain boundaries are, or if there's uh, defect bounds associated with oxygen interstitials or vacancies. Um, this can be used, Raman mapping can be used sort of the, to, to look at the microstructure features. Um, and after this, I'm going to show some of that. So the other thing is we have this Raman hot stage, and I've been in improving our ability to get good spectra out of it. So in this case, I actually measured gadolinium oxide all the way up to 1500C, which is the max that we can go. I was expecting to see the transition at around 1250C, but all I saw was sort of a gradual shift and broadening of these peaks. Um, but I, I think that working with some of the modelers, we can provide some very useful information with this and sort of validate some models and, and work on some experimental results that way. Um, we're able to flow. We can't do backing, but we can do oxidizing and or, or reducing atmospheres in this hot stage up to 1500C and 200C per minute heating and cooling. Um, so I had thought of in, in Caitlin's presentation, we could potentially do the, do the centering reaction in situ here and watch what's going on. Maybe see if the carbon's coming out. Um, these are some examples of my previous work where I'm looking at characterizing defects in uranium oxide, um, but it kind of demonstrates the range of, of what we can look at with Raman. So uranium oxide is a very complicated system. Uranium can be four, five, or six um, plus charge state. UO2 is, is stable at room temperature, and as you heat it, it'll oxidize up to U308 through a couple different intermediate phases which have different ratios of uranium four, five, and six. Um, on, the, on the right there are spectra of the three major phases that we see, and depending on the phase, they're also um, cubic, orthorhombic, or there's a tetragonal U307, but I don't see that. Um, so depending on the oxide phase, you can see some significant difference there, as well as doping. So we have our, our TQG, which is just the uranium oxygen stretch. And if we dope it or if we irradiate it, um, we see that peak shift or broaden um, as we introduce defects or as we change the lattice parameter. Um, there's also this band, which in UO2 we just call the defect band. There's, we can deconvolute it into three, three different ranges. And that tells us things about lattice symmetry, oxygen vacancies, or oxygen interstitials. Um, and there's been quite a lot of work on on doing this with cerium oxide as well. So it's, Raman spectroscopy is a, a proven technique for looking at defects in, in these doped oxide materials. Um, just a quick slide to show, we, we've done a fair amount of work lately on carbon and silicon carbide using Raman. So one thing to point out, uh, we can we can determine the polytype of silicon carbide. There's more than 170 different types, and the, comparing mostly the low wave number peaks, but also some of the 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 band at around 800, we can actually determine what the polytypes are using on um, spectroscopy. And then for samples that are, are carbon, whether it's ordered or disordered or some mix of amorphous. Um, these are ball mill silicon plus carbon, so it's very disordered. Um, there's a lot that we can also extract out of the Raman spectra on the order and disorder in carbon materials. And so continuing, I really want to use the IR microscope with this Raman mapping. Um, with the IR microscope, we can just identify areas in the samples that have low transmission, and then hopefully with the Raman microscope, identify what what the actual defect is that's, that's causing that low transmission. Um, I'd really like to work on trying to model some Raman spectra and then verify that experimentally, either just ex situ looking at dope samples or actually doing some, some heating experiments. Um, yeah, and then I, I'm happy to work with anyone who's, um, it, it seems like this can apply to a lot of different projects that, that are going on in SOAR3D. That is, that is all my head.